The sixth generation of consoles was the golden era for 3D platformers and action-adventure games. Sure, there were plenty of these titles during the PS1 and 64 era. Mario, Zelda, Sonic, and plenty of other franchises dipped their toes into the 3D space during that time from 2D, but many of them weren't really able to take full advantage of the third dimension until the PS2, GameCube, and Xbox came around. Once these consoles were released, not only could developers use the 3D space more effectively, thanks to both more powerful hardware and more experience developing these games, but they could also take more risks and incorporate new and interesting mechanics into these games. One of the games that did this best in my opinion is Prince of Persia The Sands of Time. This game was released on October 28th, 2003 for all three main consoles and PC. I obviously have the GameCube version here inside an old rental blockbuster case. When it came time for these old rental stores to get rid of old stock, they generally sell them for a reduced price, so of course, when the time came, I bought it. I'm not actually using this version for footage in this video though, since an HD re-release of the game came out on PS3 in 2010. You may not know this, but Prince of Persia The Sands of Time is actually a reboot of an old Amiga era PC franchise. This reimagining definitely shares DNA with its predecessors, but due to being in 3D, is able to do so much more with these concepts. So just like Mario and Sonic, this is a 2D franchise taking a risk and trying to translate into 3D. It was made using the Jade Engine, which was specifically created for Beyond Good and Evil. Funnily enough, The Sands of Time actually managed to release two weeks before the game its engine was designed for did. That isn't really important, but it's an interesting detail. And it was a smash hit. Since its release, The Sands of Time has sold over 14 million copies, and even for that time, with this genre being dominant, was extremely successful. It spawned two direct sequels and a prequel before Ubisoft, doing what game companies did in the early 2010s, rebooted the reboot. That's actually one of the main reasons I'm covering this game. I've never played any of the other games in this franchise, and I really want to. I could just go and play them individually, but I'd like to start at the beginning. So, with that, I guess it's about time we start. So, hey people, it's Scion Vise, and let's take a look at Prince of Persia, The Sands of Time. At first, it doesn't seem like the main menu screen here is very interesting. It's got the standard new game, load game, options and such, but when you start a new game, something interesting happens. The camera pans up to see the nameless prince on a balcony, and from here, you get to take control of him. Yeah, the story hasn't even started and we're already in control. You can only move around, so there really isn't a whole lot you can do aside from just enter the building, but it's a nice touch. So you enter the building and an opening cutscene plays. The prince introduces himself to us and explains what's going on. He and his father's army are invading an enemy's kingdom and raiding it for treasure. The prince has gone off on his own to find the Maharaja's treasure vault in order to bring glory to both himself and his father. This first area is just a tutorial. It teaches you how to jump and wall jump, how to climb, and how to use your sword. It also teaches the player about the prince's most interesting move. The prince can run along walls to reach areas he wouldn't be able to normally with a regular jump. That's the most important thing he can do to get around, and is absolutely one of my favorite individual platforming moves out there. After a few minutes of fighting and jumping, the prince sees the treasure he's after, the Dagger of Time. Unfortunately for him, it's out of reach, so he has to find a way around in order to take it. So he weaves his way around some halls while trying to not get hit by spiky poles, and he finally reaches the cavern where the dagger is held. And this is one of the most impactful areas from any game of this generation in my opinion. Seriously. Yeah, it's a tutorial area, but this game came out in 2003. Before this point, I'd never seen anything like this, and this small section was super stressful. You know how in Uncharted, Drake will be running around these ancient ruins that are crumbling around him, sometimes directly under his feet? And he just barely makes it out by the skin of his teeth? Well, the prince was doing that four years earlier. So the prince makes his way up to the dagger and finally takes it for himself. 
Then something strange happens. A large stone drops from the ceiling, but just before it crushes him, time rewinds, and after the rewind, the prince is given enough time to avoid the stone and makes his exit. He makes it back to his father, where he presents the dagger. The traitorous vizier who told the invading army where the treasure is wants the dagger for some reason, but the prince's father just lets him keep it as a souvenir. It's shown that the greatest treasure of this kingdom is a giant hourglass full of the Sands of Time. The Sands of Time are gifted to the kingdom of Azad, and curious, the prince inserts the Dagger of Time into the hourglass, and this unleashes hell. The Sands of Time consume people, turning them into horrific sand monsters that are seemingly immortal, except when they are stabbed with the Dagger. Once this horde is defeated, the prince chases after a woman who should be pretty familiar as she showed up in the opening cutscene and has been sneaking around in the tutorial area. But just before he heads out, he sees a pillar of sand and decides, yeah, that sand that's been turning people into sand beasts is definitely a safe thing to walk into. So he does, and he sees something. What he sees is not a hallucination or a dream, it's a vision of the future. This is super cool, it's not just a glimpse of story events that are going to be happening into the future, this is showing you what you as the player will be doing in the next gameplay section. It's a hint system built directly into the game's story. You can skip these visions if you want too, so it's not like it's forcing you to spoil the game's puzzles or anything. It's just a nice touch that they thought to mix these two things together like this. These sand pillars are also the game's save points, and you'll be seeing a lot of them. From here is where we get introduced to the game's platforming mechanics, and I love everything about these. The stuff that was introduced in the tutorial is just the beginning. Throughout the game you'll be doing all sorts of crazy stuff, but it's all built around a few specific mechanics. Outside of just running and jumping, you'll also be jumping around from pillars, you'll be swinging on horizontal bars, and you'll be climbing around on ledges. Eventually, you'll even be breaking walls by finding stronger and stronger swords. Individually, it's not all that interesting, but these things are all mixed together in a lot of different ways throughout the game, and it gets super cool and pretty difficult. You'll be doing things like running along a wall, then jumping at the right time to grab onto a pillar, or you'll run up a wall to swing onto a bar, and then you'll swing from a bar to a wall, which you'll jump off to get to a higher bar and to a safe area. It's super hard to explain, but it's just so fun to get from place to place here. Obviously, it's not as cinematic as some games in later generations would be, but the experience and feeling you get from exploring these places and completing these platforming challenges is just as strong. You'll be exploring these dilapidated caverns or ancient ruins, making crazy jumps and climbing on ledges that could collapse at any second. It's a thrill, genuinely. There's some puzzles you'll need to solve as well. They're not difficult by any stretch of the imagination, but they're a fun pace breaker, and they keep things interesting as you explore the palace. You do have to keep an eye on your surroundings too, as in a few areas, you'll find a weird hall, which will transport you to a strange spring. By drinking the water here, your health bar will increase. There's 10 of them total throughout the game and they are missable, so you'll have to watch or you could end up with less HP than you could have. You may make mistakes while jumping around, which is where the Dagger of Time comes in. That sequence at the start where time rewound? That was no coincidence. The Dagger of Time gives the Prince the ability to rewind up to 10 seconds of time as long as it has the resources. On the left side of the screen, you'll see a few circles. These are what the dagger uses to rewind time. Each rewind takes one charge, however, if time was altered in some way during that 10 second period, the rewind will be limited to that time. You have a limited number of uses, but you can get more throughout the game by finding sand piles and absorbing them. For every 10 you collect, you get a new charge for your rewind ability. It's a really cool mechanic, and while it can seem like a crutch, the levels require a lot of experimentation, and it won't just automatically punish you for making mistakes, it gives you a bit of leeway. Of course, if you run out of sand or lose all your health, you will die. The game over screen is pretty great. The prince will say something about that not actually happening and asking for a do-over on that part. That didn't happen. It's pretty funny when you think about it. Like. 
the prince will be telling his story and then he'll say something like, then I tripped on a stone and fell off a cliff to my death. Then he'll realize that doesn't make any sense and back it all up saying like, no, wait, 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 no, 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 that, that didn't happen. You're not really punished that hard for dying either as you're just sent back to the last checkpoint, but you do get a lot of chances and have a lot of options to get around. The level design is pretty good for all this stuff too. It uses all these mechanics really well and manages to not feel super railroady. Obviously, there's probably only one way to reach any specific place, but the game still manages to make you feel kinda smart when you finish a room or complete some challenges. However, it does make the levels look pretty video gamey. For instance, there's a section that takes place in a prison, but this is no ordinary prison. It's a huge hole in the ground that is seemingly impossible to scale unless you are capable of running along walls for long periods of time. It makes for good, fun levels, but the suspension of disbelief struggles a bit. But that doesn't matter. At the end of the day, what matters is if the game is fun, and it really, really is. I played this game through twice for this video, and it was just as fun the second time around. What was actually more fun the second time through was the combat. So we know the only real way to defeat the sand creatures is to absorb the sand with the dagger. This is going to be how you'll be finishing off almost all of your enemies throughout the game. It's an integral part of the game's combat. I really like the combat system in this game for the most part too. There are a decent amount of enemies and all of them have different attack patterns, different weaknesses, and different ways to defeat them. During combat, the prince will find himself fighting off hordes of sand creatures. Another person, Farah, joins you throughout the majority of the game and she does help you out in these fights. You can attack with your sword, which does damage, and after enough damage is done, you can knock the enemies to the ground for a finisher. Once the enemies are on the ground, that's when you use the dagger to finally take them out. But it's not that simple, thankfully. The prince is clearly an acrobatic guy, so he has a lot of different things he can do to make combat easier on himself. He can roll around to avoid attacks, he can jump off of walls to knock enemies down, and most importantly, he can vault over enemies. Vaulting is to combat what wall running is to exploration. You're going to be doing it all the time, even when you probably shouldn't. When you vault over an enemy, you can attack them with your sword. For most enemies, this will knock them down automatically so you can quickly absorb them with the dagger. Some enemies are super weak to being vaulted, so you can just combo one sword swing right into a dagger stab to kill the enemies without even needing to knock them to the ground. Thankfully, this doesn't actually work on every enemy, since the combat would be super easy at that point. Some enemies will block the dagger when being vaulted, requiring you to knock them to the ground with your sword, and some enemies, mainly the blue colored enemies, will not allow you to vault over them at all. The glaive enemies can be hit with the sword normally when they aren't blocking, but the scimitar enemies are much more difficult to deal with. You'll need to either block their attacks and counter, or use the dagger which has its own functions in combat. The crescents in the UI allow the dagger to do a couple different things in combat. If you just stab at an enemy with one or more of these full, you'll freeze them in place, allowing them to be defeated easily without having to absorb them. On top of rewinding time, you can also slow down time for a bit as well, which will allow you to vault over enemies that normally would stop you, and let you avoid attacks that you would normally be hit by. The last time power is the most powerful of all of them. By pressing two trigger buttons at once, you can combine all of your powers into one burst that can quickly defeat a lot of enemies. Time stops, enemies freeze, and you quickly dash from baddie to baddie, defeating them in a single hit. It eats up all of your sand though, so it's something that you can't just use willy-nilly. The combat is really fun for the most part. Honestly, the biggest problem I have with the combat is that each combat section just takes so long. Enemies will just keep coming and coming, and every single combat section can last upwards of 15 minutes. And when there's six or more enemies surrounding you every time, it can also get pretty tedious. I would have preferred if there were fewer enemies, but they were a bit more difficult and required more thought to defeat. It's certainly flashy as it is, but it eventually wears out its welcome. And it is a little bit janky. 
The prince is pretty acrobatic, but his attacks are very rigid in terms of their hitboxes and functions. So if you vault over an enemy and manage to fall down onto a tiny stone, there's a good chance the attack just won't happen. And since vault and roll are tied to the same button, you'll definitely be trying to vault over enemies you shouldn't, even when you're trying to roll away from attacks. Defeating enemies does have a purpose on its own too. For every 16 enemies you defeat, you get an extra charge for the combat dagger ability as long as you have a rewind charge to match it. However, early on it seemed like they were filling out too quickly as these rewind charges fill out much more slowly. And you fill out like 5 of these crescents before getting one extra rewind. It balances out eventually, but it kind of seemed like weird pacing for that. But that's really it. The gameplay here is top notch and it's really surprising that more games haven't tried to copy it. It still holds up even over 15 years later. Now for visuals and sound, it is very early 2000s. The game doesn't look bad by any stretch of the imagination, but it's not exactly going above and beyond what these systems could do. Faces look kinda bad, especially when trying to talk, which is pretty standard for that time. The art design is really good though, and it really captures the Arabian feel with the architecture and character designs. It's hard to judge the visuals of a game like this, since it is still an early 3D game, but nothing really stuck out about this game as awful looking. It looks good, but there clearly is a lot more that could have been done on these consoles. Sound is all over the place. Obviously everything is compressed to hell, so dialogue is brittle and grainy. The sound effects are decent, but there really isn't a lot of them, so you'll be hearing the same enemy screams over and over and over, and the sound mixing is awful. You can adjust the sound levels, but that really doesn't even fix things. Some sounds will be super loud, and some things, like dialogue, will just be super quiet. It's even worse in cutscenes as it's almost impossible to hear things properly unless you have the sound cranked, but then you get your ears blasted by the effects. The game's soundtrack is pretty great though. It was composed by Stuart Chatwood. Of the Tea Party? Yo, that's super cool. Anyone outside of Canada probably don't have any idea who they are. But the Tea Party is a really interesting band that was pretty big in Canada during the mid to late 90s. This like legit blew my mind. I like the Tea Party, but I don't like them enough to go digging for this sort of info. It does kind of make sense though. Sands of Time was developed in Canada, so it makes sense that a Canadian developer would be working on it. And considering the Tea Party's sound, it wouldn't be too much of a departure for any members of that band to compose for this game. Sorry for that tangent, I kind of geeked out for a bit. The soundtrack is fairly reminiscent of Tea Party music in some small ways. It's got a really nice Arabic sound with rock accompaniment. It's great and I do have some favorites here. Lost in the Crypts. Trouble in the Barracks. and the royal baths. But with that out of the way, I guess it's time to talk about the story. Before the plot, however, I want to talk about the two main protagonists, the prince and Farah. They're both really endearing characters and help make the game what it is. The prince is a sarcastic wisecracker who talks to himself when he's alone and tries to make the best of any given situation. He's also the game's narrator, breaking the fourth wall pretty frequently to speak directly to the player. The game would be so much less interesting if you were a more serious, less snarky guy. Farah is the second protagonist and she joins the prince for the majority of the game. She is much more earnest and spends a lot of time looking after the prince and working to help him progress. 
she works as a good contrast to the prince's levity while not being a complete downer either. And she isn't completely incapable of being snarky or breaking the fourth wall either. If you want to be useful, try finding a book that'll tell us how to get out of here. This isn't that kind of game. Game? She thinks this is a game. But she is the one who is more grounded and focused on the task at hand. The relationship between the prince and Farah is pretty well done too. At the start, they both dislike and distrust each other, so the interactions between them are pretty cold and standoffish. Farah dislikes the prince for unleashing the sands of time, and the prince thinks Farah is just waiting for any moment to stab him in the back and steal the dagger. Their relationship develops pretty naturally throughout the game though. They start talking more naturally, with the prince starting to crack wise all the time, a trait I find quite endearing, and they start to open up. The prince even starts to fall in love with Farah, and she seems to hint at the fact that she may have fallen for the prince as well. This whole angle could have seemed like an escort mission similar to Resident Evil 4, but Farah holds her own well enough in battles and is endearing enough of a character that both she and the prince work as protagonists. The dialogue in general here is just really good too. The banter between the prince and Farah are really fun to listen to, and the prince's monologues are both really interesting and a great look into the character himself. Okay, so now it's time to talk about the actual plot. I'll put a timestamp somewhere in the video if you want to skip the story, but again, you're not really missing too much. The plot here is paper thin, and it's largely about the relationship between the prince and Farah. So, the prince is stuck in this palace, surrounded by sand creatures, and for some reason, he and Farah are completely unaffected. The prince sees the hourglass of time being moved to the top of a tower by some sand birds, and he decides that he has to make his way there to see if he can stop everything that's occurring. Eventually, the prince catches up to Farah, and she demands that he give her the dagger, as she knows how to undo all the damage the prince caused. Not surprisingly, he doesn't trust her, so he holds onto the dagger, but they try to stick together regardless while they head towards where the hourglass of time is held. What happens in between these characters meeting and reaching the hourglass of time really doesn't matter. The most interesting thing that happens from a story perspective is that the prince meets his father, now in sand form, and has to kill him. Outside of that, it's really just a journey, going from place to place, getting closer and closer to the hourglass of time. When they reach the hourglass, the prince leaps on it and is going to use the dagger, but he hesitates, as he still has some doubts about some of Farah's motives. Because of this, the vizier, who took the hourglass, was able to defeat both of them. He blows them out of the tower, and they fall into the palace's catacombs. In the catacombs, Farah confides in the prince and tells him that her mother gave her a word to say whenever she was scared and that a door would open for her at that time. Kakulikiam. I'm pretty sure I just murdered that pronunciation, but it's a real word, look it up. Sort of. So, they both say the word, and wouldn't you know it, a path opens for them. After a very long staircase and the lost woods, the two find themselves in a strange bath. One which the prince assumes was all a dream. When he awoke, his sword and dagger were both gone, stolen by Farah, who went off on her own to finish the job that the prince was unable to last time. The prince finds the last of several swords in the palace, one which can defeat any sand creature in one swing, and chases after Farah. Back in the Tower of Dawn, Farah is overrun by the monsters and falls off a balcony. The prince tries to save her by grabbing the dagger's blade, but Farah, knowing what could happen if the prince uses the dagger in the hourglass, lets go and falls to her death. Enraged by her death, the prince rejects the vizier's offer of eternal life if he turns over the dagger, and stabs the hourglass with the dagger. This rewinds time to back before the first attack ever happened, and the prince makes his way to Farah's bedroom. At this point, it's revealed that the prince wasn't telling us, the players, the story of what happened in Azad. He was recounting his tale to Farah herself, to warn her of all the events that would come to pass if the vizier is not stopped and the dagger is not hidden. This was such a cool twist. When I first played the game, I originally thought that it was nothing more than a nice little detail, like, 
Oh, cool, the prince is telling us his story. I thought similarly about the opening balcony scene as well. But no, not only is it important, but it's effectively foreshadowing. And after this point, everything that's happening is no longer a retelling. It's actually happening. The vizier shows up to interrupt the story, kill the prince, and take the dagger for himself. This is the final boss battle of the game. It's also the least interesting fight, frankly. You just hit him and he eventually dies. And die he does. The prince kills the traitorous vizier and returns the dagger to Farah. Farah doesn't believe the prince's story and the prince goes in for a kiss. Farah responds to that correctly and the prince rewinds time a few seconds. As the prince leaves, Farah asks him what his name is. The prince responds, Kakulukiam. On that note, the credits roll. This game was a blast and it still holds up so well. And so many games were influenced by it too. The Uncharted series, Assassin's Creed series, even Batman Arkham Asylum, just to name a few. So it's kind of strange that this franchise in particular kind of just faded into obscurity. So I really hope that a game, especially this game, gets a bit of a modern touch-up. I played both the GameCube and PS3 versions for this video, and despite the PS3 version releasing more than five years after the fact, if you can live without the widescreen, I'd recommend the original release. The PS3 version is really buggy and is missing loads of sound effects, and the visuals really aren't any better. It's just a uh, high resolution with a 16 by 9 aspect ratio. Really disappointing, honestly. If we could get a proper from the ground up remake, I'd be just over the moon. So much of this game was so ahead of its time that even giving it the Shadow of the Colossus treatment of just improving the presentation but leaving the original gameplay intact would be amazing. But in the meantime, while I'm waiting for that, I guess I'll move on to the sequel, The Warrior Within. That game was released a mere 13 months after the Sands of Time, and it got a pretty decent reaction from what I could see. All I really know about it is the box art, and that isn't making me too hopeful. So I hope it proves me wrong. Anyways, thank you very much for watching, I hope you liked this one. So if you did, leave a like or comment or whatever, and I will see you in the next video. See you all later.